good day and welcome to the Double Line Strategic Commodity Fund webcast. Today's conference is being recorded. At this time, I'd like to turn the conference over to Sam Newsbaum, Product Specialist at Double Line. Please go ahead. Thank you and good afternoon and welcome to the Double Line Strategic Commodity webcast hosted by portfolio managers Sam Lau and Jeffrey Mayberry. The Double Line Strategic Commodity Fund is offered in two share classes, the retail end share and the institutional I share. Uh, minimum investment amounts and expense ratios are listed here on this slide. And in terms of the fund's performance, the fund is off to a strong start uh, to begin 2023. Uh, the fund is outperforming its benchmark, the Bloomberg Commodity Index, by 282 basis points year to date through January 31 for the I share and by 272 basis points for the end share through January 31st. Since inception of the fund back in May of 2015 through January of this year, the fund is outperforming its benchmark by 279 basis points annualized for the I share and 252 basis points annualized for the end share. You can see uh, the performance of the fund for both share classes uh, on this slide here. Some upcoming webcast announcements uh, on March 7th, we'll have our first total return webcast of 2023 hosted by DoubleLine CEO and CIO Jeffrey Gunlock and Portfolio Manager Andrew Sue. On April 11th, we'll host a smart beta webcast which covers the multi-asset trend, real estate and income, Schiller Enhanced CAPE, and Schiller Enhanced International CAPE funds. To register for DoubleLine webcasts, uh, and to see the upcoming schedule for all of our webcasts, please visit our website at DoubleLine.com. And finally, from me, a uh, roundup of some of DoubleLine's thought leadership, which is also available on DoubleLine.com, uh, beginning with our Roundtable Prime series, which was recorded in January with Jeffrey Gunlock and a number of different thought leaders in the space in a conversation that's moderated by DoubleLine Deputy CIO Jeffrey Sherman. Uh, then we have Double Line's Channel 11 video series, a monthly video series that's hosted by portfolio manager Ken Shinoda. And our two podcasts, uh, first the Monday Morning Minutes podcast hosted by today's webcast hosts, portfolio managers Sam Lau and Jeffrey Mayberry. Uh, they cover topical market commentary and macro events and a podcast that's released on Friday afternoons. And then finally, the Sherman Show podcast hosted by its namesake, Deputy CIO Jeffrey Sherman, and Portfolio Manager Sam Lau. Double Line podcasts are available on a number of different outlets, including Spotify, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, and more. Uh, and of course, you can find all of our insights on DoubleLine.com. So with that, let me turn the webcast over to Portfolio Managers Sam Lau and Jeffrey Mayberry. Well, thanks, Sam Nussbaum. Um, thanks, everyone, uh, for, for joining us today, and happy day after President's Day here for everyone. Uh, we've got a picture of uh, Mount Rushmore here and what started out as a dream of using an image of Mount Rushmore from the Simpsons, Simpsons sorry, uh, where there was an oil rig coming out of Teddy Roosevelt's head. Uh, we had to eventually settle on this and eventually land on this plain vanilla compliance uh, friendly pick. So um, here we are. But uh, let's start out with a look at the broad basket of commodity futures. And here we have the past few years of the Bloomberg Commodity Index, which is a broad basket of commodities ranging anywhere from industrial metals uh, in that complex, to energy to agriculture um, and precious metals as well. And you can see that commodities have had a big run beginning with the pandemic uh, in 2020, which culminated with the recent peak uh, recently in 2022 on the back of the Russian invasion of the Ukraine, where fears of war-related supply disruptions um, affected a, a number of commodity prices there. And that led to the index rallying quite sharply in the first half of 2022, before coming back to trade in, more in line with what I thought to be the, the, the right supply and dem demand fundamentals. But the last few <clears throat> months of commodities have really trended down as we've faced uh, macro headwinds around the prospects of slowing economic activity. And so today, when we take a look at it, and this is represented by the red line there, uh, the index is now below its 200-day moving average. And you know, 
in the setup, it's potentially a better and more attractive uh, entry point for those who are still on the sidelines here. But I guess the question remains where the commodities go from here. Um, and you had a little bit of a glimpse on this, if for those of you who tuned in early at um, at the, the top of the hour, where we do show snippets of, of past uh, webcasts and other information that we had. And if you did tune in early, you, you probably saw me and Mr. Mayberry uh, giving our rationale for investing in commodities. And this is more or less a persistent type of theme for investing in commodities. But the rationale of why you should hold strategic position in commodities in your portfolio is several. First, commodities can provide diversification to a portfolio of traditional financial assets. Uh, secondly, they can act as a hedge um, against inflation. And then you have third, you have the opportunity to generate incremental returns in the space. And then lastly, as raw inputs, commodities generally participate in the global growth cycle. So you have the cyclicality of the, the global economy there. And we've seen each of these four um, reasons or rationale for investing in commodities really play out in this post-pandemic era. Drilling in for a closer look here, we have the diversification benefit. And you can see in that first row, um, I've outlined there in red, we have the correlation of the Bloomberg Commodity Index um, to a number of traditional financial assets that you're likely to have in your portfolios. And as we move across the top row, commodities have a low correlation to, um, you can see here, to both equities as well as credit in the fixed income space. Uh, they're largely uncorrelated to the U.S. bond aggregate there and negatively correlated to both U.S. rates as well as the, as well as the U.S. dollar against a basket of, um, of other developed market uh, uh, currencies there. But all in all, when we look at it against this cohort, that results in an average correlation of uh, 0.18 to a basket of these assets that we have listed there again across the top row. And so when we think about diversification and the role it plays um, with that type of exposure, you, you, you want, it only benefits you if you own it before you know, the, the need is required, or it, it largely benefits you if you're already an existing holder. And we saw that really play out through both 2021, but especially in 2022. Here you can see um, the Bloomberg Commodity uh, Index over there on the far right. And on the top part of the, the panels here, we have... Uh, the performance, the total return across various asset classes in 2022. Um, on the right side, we have commodities uh, moving from the right to the left. Uh, we have uh, currencies and then we have fixed income and then we have equities. So kind of reverse order from which your eyes would normally read. But the Bloomberg Commodity Index, you can see there a broad basket of commodities was up 16% in 2022. The GSCI, which is more oil heavy than the BCOM, which is a little bit more um, equitable in the distribution across the various uh, commodity complexes there uh, for sectors, but the GSCI was up 26%. And this is all in the world where both the the Bloomberg um, bar, or the Bloomberg U.S. bond aggregate, as well as the S&P 500, were both uh, in the negative teens. So when we look at that again in the top panel, there really wasn't anywhere to hide outside of um, commodities and the U.S. dollar. Uh, the U.S. dollar being up uh, 8% again on that against that basket of DM currencies there. On the bottom panel, uh, we have thus far the, the year-to-date performance of these same asset classes in 2023. And we've had a little bit of what we like to call the other way around bro here at Double Line. Um, there's been a reversal in performance with both broad commodity baskets uh, now printing red for the short year-to-date period. Um, and then uh, you also have the traditional asset classes there, especially with the, the equity side, out to a strong start uh, for, for 2023 thus far uh, with, with uh, the Bloomberg commodity. I'm sorry, the Bloomberg, uh, we have the Barclays egg on there, but the, the Bloomberg U.S. bond aggregate is pretty much flat on a year-to-day basis after starting uh, January out with quite a bang. It's, it's the, some of that positive momentum has started to shift of late, um, especially in the fixed income space. So, uh, we do have a long way to go, and we'll just see how the, the rest of the year progresses here. When it comes to the inflation benefit, you know, for, for commodities, inflation makes, I mean, commodities make uh, uh, account, some make some sense as a hedge for, for inflation, because commodities are really the, the building blocks for many of the things that we do consume on a daily basis. And to help illustrate this, we've overlaid the CPI 
um, the consumer price index on a year over year basis relative to the Bloomberg Commodity Index. And here you can see that the relationship appears to be quite strong. Um, we've seen that the uh, inflation related data prints uh, recently have been coming in higher than expected as well uh, in the past few weeks, especially with both CPI and PPI um, beating expectations uh, uh, on, the, on the relevant data points that were printed last week, as well as uh, retail sales were also uh, beating expectations la with last week's data as well. Um, and then two weeks ago, we had the strong payroll and jobs data. So all of that bodes uh, for, or at least indicates a uh, for for uh, a strong consumer over the next uh, few data prints, at least. So uh, the question I think we leaves us with right here is where does CPI go? And to help think about this, um, our team from the the multi asset team they created this chart based on scenarios of, of which way uh, U.S. CPI inflation on a year over year basis could go. And on this, if you look at the left, we have the path of year-over-year -year headline CPI that has already taken place from um, the same time last year through its most current print uh, today, which is January 2023, and that's represented by the solid blue line. And you can see, for the most part, it's been in decline since it printed the high of uh, 9%, it looks like, in June of 2022. Um, from that most recent current print, our, our team, our macro team, again, they break out uh, various scenarios that CPI could, could take. The solid orange line there is for uh, market-based expectations based on CPI fixings. Um, and you can see that goes through the end of this year. And based on what you see there, you see a deceleration in year-over-year -year CPI. And that's expected to, to stall somewhat by, by June of this year based largely on, on um base effects. And then from there, it's kind of uh, flatlined uh, for the remaining six months of 2023. Now, the dotted lines represent scenarios for CPI using static month-over-month -month prints based on predetermined levels by, again, our, our macro asset team, uh, our multi-asset team, I should say. You can see on one end, uh, represented by that gray dash line, if which shows if month-over-month -month CPI was held steady at zero um, through the rest of the year, then you would expect CPI on a year-over-year -year basis to, to dip to zero. There's no real surprise there. But on the flip then, uh, flip side, if you take a look at the green dash line there, um, that's using the January, the most recent uh, month-over-month -month print of 0.52% uh, and just held there for the remainder of the year. You can see you still get that deceleration on the base effects out to June 2023. But from there, you can see inflation would get pushed back above six uh, percent year over year. Now, both of these are kind of the bookends of, of the the scenarios that the the multi asset team took in. They're a bit extreme uh, based on what we're seeing today. But I would see say that we're we're likely to see some type of uh, average month over month print somewhere between that uh, let's call it the lighter orange color of zero point two four percent. And that happens to be the, the average monthly print uh, looking at the last six months of 2022. Um, and below that of, of the 0.52 that we saw in January. So somewhere between that 0.24 and the 0.252, I think is reasonable to think that inflation may uh, shake out somewhere around there. Um, so it is quite possible that inflation could creep back up in the second half of 2023 under one of those scenarios. And I do think commodity relation inflation could be the wild card there. So that brings us to the current case of commodities. Um, again, if you're listening to that kind of the double line on the hour at one o'clock, if you showed up early, you kind of heard the same rationale that we've been talking about, not just for the last year, but actually for the last two years. But what's new here is we have this new primary headwind, which is largely a macro one. And that's the uncertainty related to the path of economic activity, both here in the US as well as globally. Um, I think a slowdown is in economic activity is definitely one that can't be dismissed, but I do think a number of commodities have already begun to price that risk in, as we saw in the outset of the slides that I showed on the Bloomberg Commodity Index. But I think the counterpoint to a slowdown will really be this path of reopening in China and the potential for recovery there. Uh, despite some of this near-term macro uncertainty, we do have longer-term drivers of supply and demand. Uh, that could potentially make for another attractive year uh, of performance for a broad basket of commodities. 
And just looking at this uh, list in front of you again, um, you know, I'll go through them, but many of these drivers are the same ones that boosted commodity prices back in 2021, in 2022 again, and I think that they're still in place today. So on the demand side, uh, beyond just the near term, the, the world is you know, still transitioning in from this dependency on fossil fuels as an energy source to one where it hopes to, to rely on clean energy sources. There's been a consortium of 190 countries that have signed on to this uh, so-called or into this uh, Paris Climate Treaty. And together, those 190 countries have a stated goal of achieving uh, net zero carbon emissions by the year of 2050. But in order to accomplish that, they're really going to need a significant infrastructure build out to get us there. And that inherently is going to be commodity intensive. And we've been saying for, for quite some time now that that's the irony of it all. You know, to, to get clean, you got to really get dirty first. Um, but that move to carbon neutrality is a double edged sword because it requires not only that uptick in consumption of these old world commodities that are that do emit carbon emissions. Um, and are bad for perhaps the environment when you're strip mining for, for metals there. Uh, but it also makes investments towards the, the future production of fossil fuels and industrial metals less attractive. Um, the reason for that is there's reputation risk around ESG concerns and you know just trying to meet these carbon emission goals. So what that means is allocating capital to this industry, this old kind of old world uh, commodity industry, that's intended really to be phased out over time. It's not going to be very attractive in, in terms of a use of capital expenditure. So what we've really seen over the last decade or so is just miners and, and uh, energy-based companies have shifted their focus from production of future um, uh, commodity supply to more so look on the profitability based on a combination of really um, shareholder pressure to to reinvest more in you know improving shareholder positions rather than the production of future commodities. So rather than spending capital on those new investments, um, they've really been focusing on trying to maintain shareholder value. So with that, supply side is continues to be a bottleneck to the energy tr transition um, based demand. And a lot of these commodities that are necessary for infrastructure build out are currently at low inventory levels and they also have limited future production cap capabilities you know just based on this this uh, on your investment that I've been talking about here. And then finally of course you have that specter of uh, supply disruption from geopolitical risk which is always really lurking out there. Um, the Russian invasion of Ukraine continues to leave supply chains in an uncertain position for many of these commodities. So taking a, a look at uh, you know, some of these drivers in more detail, here we have the total U.S. crude oil inventory. And you can see um, here that uh, what I have on the page and includes both the private side as well as the public inventory. The public inventory means the, uh, the strategic petroleum reserve here in the U.S. Um, and the shaded fill represents the range of inventory levels going back 15 years. And that's uh, those levels are indicated on the vertical axis there on the right hand side. And the months of the year are across the uh, horizontal axis over time. And the red line there at the bottom right hand, uh, bottom left hand corner, I should say, um, shows where inventories have been in, let's say, the first uh, seven weeks of the year or so. And you can see that the the start of 2023 thus far, as as shown as the seasonal inventory build, is really at the lowest that's been in the past 15 years, um, by what looks to be more than about uh, 100 million barrels or so relative to the previous lows when you're looking at at the same point of time over the last 15 years. So it's not off to a great start for, for inventory levels. Uh, but here on the chart, we see the primary reason for those low inventories. And that's the sharp drawdown that you have in the U.S. Strategic Petroleum Reserves. Um, back on the title there, you can see it says back to all time lows. It's funny, we used the same chart um, about uh, 10 months ago now, actually uh, nine months ago, I want to say now, but uh, we were we were talking about uh, back then, the, the title actually said U.S. Uh, strategic Petroleum Reserves back to the 80s. And there was a question mark because that was kind of around the time when uh, the Biden administration started to release um, uh, the emergency reserves. But 
Uh, today, it's actually you surpassed that. Uh, we are back to the 80s, and now we're we're challenging it and asking are we going to back, go back to all time lows. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with the the SPR, uh, which stands for the Strategic Petroleum Reserves, you can think about it as our nation's emergency stockpile of oil that's there really to buffer um, against unexpected supply sh shocks that could come from natural disasters, uh, geopolitical risk, or just other weather related events. So, you know, I mentioned it before, but in 2022, you can see that sharp drop off. That's because we released 180 million barrels of oil um, uh, on that so-called emergency release. I think the emergency was really the fact that uh, crude oil prices got a little bit too high rather than there being a significant uh, supply disruption there. So that's got us back to the reserves to areas that we haven't seen since the 80s. Um, what I'm going to do here is, you know, rather than go more into the SPRs, you know, I'm going to put a shameless plug here for me and Mr. Mayberry for our podcast that we have called Monday Morning Minutes in there. You know, we, we devoted two episodes to the Strategic Petroleum Reserves. That's uh, episodes uh, 41 and, 100 and 103, 41 and 103 for those who want to take a deeper dive into the SPR. But back to this uh, webcast at hand, here's the longer run look at inventories. You can see that the the you know, some of these, uh, oops, let's see here. You can see that, um, you know, similar to the the uh, strategic petroleum reserve, sorry, that the uh, inventory levels are just kind of where we were just off of uh, 1985. So um, definitely the impact of the emergency release seen here. Now, this is gonna look familiar, but uh, to the crude inventory 15 year lows that we saw before, this time it's for the U.S. Uh, distillate stocks inventory. And you can see those are also uh, below their 15-year range, not quite as you know, drastic as it was for the crude inventory levels, but they're still there uh, below uh, nonetheless. But for those of you who are unfamiliar, distillates are effectively the, the refined um, oil products, something like heating oil or you know, the, the type of fuel, the grade of fuel that you might be using in your car or your truck or you know, even a um, for commercial planes or just planes in general through jet fuel. So um, those are also at a 15 year low. Um, and I mentioned earlier too, that uh, supply constraints are gonna continue to be a issue moving forward. Here's one of the reasons plotted out as capital expenditures for oil and gas. Uh, these are investments that again, would go towards the future production capacity uh, of oil and gas in this, in this chart as it's represented. Uh, and these are real, so they are inflation in just inflation adjusted figures there. But as you can see, as I pointed out earlier, there's been a reluctance, um, you know, for for producers to um, really add to the amount of internal investments that they're putting towards that future capacity. And it's really been interesting to see the discipline shown by oil producers and gas producers, despite high oil prices in the past few years, and Again, you know, uh, that's largely due to a combination of the ESG and this transition to green energy, which makes uh, the return of investment on these type of projects less attractive for um, the future of fo fossil fuel uh, type of investments. Um, and also, again, the, the adherence to, to kind of produce or prioritizing shareholder value. So... Um, this one is not unique. I will, I'm going to front, my, front run myself a little bit here. It's not unique just to oil and gas. You'll see that it's very similar to uh, what we're seeing in industrial metals as well. I'm going to skip that previous chart for the sake of time here. But uh, when we take a look at the, what's called the crude oil stocks to, to use ratio, um, this ratio here provides an estimate for the number of days coverage, and that's based on the, the current oil inventory. Um, and this is globally, it's not just the U.S., but global oil inventory for OPEC-based countries um, relative to the consumption of these OECD countries. So uh, here you can see on the chart that uh, we're just at about 29 days of coverage. You can see while it's been on the rise from the low of, uh, that reached down to 26 days or so, it's still relatively low. To history. One of the things that you know we hear a lot about in the headlines is OPEC, and those headlines can certainly impact crude oil prices over time, but oftentimes it, it does leave you know our commodity team here at Double Line 
And I'd imagine elsewhere, you know, just kind of scratching our heads, these headlines, because the potential real impact oftentimes is far less exciting than the headlines would make them out to be. Um, but here, what we have is the estimated production across various uh, OPEC countries, um, and that's represented in the dark blue. If you take out the magnifying glass, you'll find this light blue shade, which is the amount of spare capacity by country. And you can see all the way over there on the right, it aggregates up to 1.6 million barrels uh, a day of potential produ production capacity across these OPEC countries in what I would imagine would be a best case scenario. If you layer on that orange fill, that's a uh, 1.1 million uh, barrels a day per or from Iran. That's uh, that in itself, I think, is somewhat questionable, and it's probably lower than 1.1 million from Iran, just given production maintenance needs and and uh, the impact of uh, potential sanctions. But overall, you know, as I indicated, the the headline often is sexier than reality because, as we saw in 2022. Um, there was this kind of persistent fear in the background that OPEC could increase uh, production to, to help lower prices, but the reported increase usually was in excess of what their uh, spare capacity in actuality would be. So um, a little bit uh, more noise from the headlines than actual uh, news. Let's move on from this slide here, uh, and we can talk about kind of the recovery of, of mobility, which is a, a key component of demand. Um, here we narrowed it out to air traffic, but overall transportation accounts for about 70% of energy needs from, um, uh, I should say actually from, from the use of crude oil based products. Uh, but here we do have air traffic growth and you can see while we're, this is in back, indexed back to December, 2019, we are somewhat below those, you know, December, 2019 levels, but it, across most regions, Regions, we're well on that path towards recovery. You know, perhaps if this continues, then you know we should start seeing uh, back to these 2019 levels by some point this year. But the one exception here remains is is the Asia Pacific region. Um, you can see that largely has accelerated um, more so in the last year or so, beginning with the with 2022. Um, but I think with the, the reopening of China in the past few months, I do suspect this catch-up phase to begin in earnest here as travel starts to pick up, especially intra-Asia intra sometime in 2023. And that, of course, would lead to a, a boost in demand for, for uh, jet fuel. And then here, um, we're going to switch gears from uh, crude oil, and we're going to move into other areas that should benefit uh, perhaps a little bit more from the clean energy transition that I was talking about before. Um, although it will boost the demand for crude oil products, I do think that for the build out of green energy infrastructure, industrial metals are probably going to be a little bit more sensitive. So what I have here are projections that are compiled by Morgan Stanley, um, and it shows the progression of from basically fossil fuel dependence or dominance, I should say, not necessarily dependence, but from fossil fuel dominance to renewable and uh, hydrogen, or sorry, not hydrogen, hydroelectric type of, uh, of energy sources. So you can see in 2020, um, coal and gas makes up nearly 60% of the total energy generation mix versus about 19% in the um, clean energy sources. By 2030, um, you can see that renewables and hydro really step up massively as a, as a percentage. You can just see from the shaded areas there that it becomes to, it starts to, to outgenerate in terms of as a percentage of energy generation, uh, that of gas and nuclear. And then if you think about 2023, that big jump, it, it kind of makes sense because that is a key milestone to those to some of these client and climate agreements, uh, largely that Paris Treaty uh, agreement for the 2050 net zero, but 2030 is a key milestone there as well, kind of a, a checkpoint in, in terms of the progress. And then by the time you get to 2035, it's it's basically projected by um, the projections compiled by Morgan Stanley that it's going to be game over uh, when it comes to which one will be the dominant energy source. And, you know, as I, as I talk through it and I think about it, you know, that could give people question and pause and thinking about, okay, that's the, uh, the death of demand for, for fossil fuels. You know, that should be a headwind for, for fossil fuels. But I think the slide, as I'm talking through it, you know, it, itself, it kind of shows this tug of war that's going to be played out between uh, crude oil supply and demand factors. I mean, if you think about it as the demand over the long run, 
Uh, it could wane, but it's still going to be needed during this transition period. I mean, that was a lesson we learned in 2022, especially in Europe, um, that you just can't flip a switch there. Um, Petroleum-related commodities are going to be needed throughout this green energy transition in order to build out reliable sources of um, clean energy, um, something that we, do, we, we, we aren't quite there yet. So I think on the supply side, this adds to that underinvestment uh, thesis that I was talking about in CapEx, because again, just from this, it looks less attractive from a return on investment perspective. Um, so with that, I mean, you're, you're likely to see a longer run supply demand imbalance that is and should be supported for, for future, future you know, crude oil prices in the near and the medium term. Um, on slide 24, you know, we have uh, estimated annual investments. I'm going to pass through it fairly quickly for the sake of time, but you can see over the next you know, few decades or so, there's you know, anywhere from a, mil a minimum of a trillion dollars in annual investments that are required somewhere in 2023, 24, out to just under 3 trillion in 2035 or so. Um, so basically that spigot of investment capital is going to be required over the next few decades in order to get us to that, uh, uh, that point where we adhere to the net zero neutrality. And here um, we have a uh, uh, shift to the industrial metal stocks, similar to what we saw of crude oil and distillate inventories. You can see that um, industrial metals um, inventories that we have here, I have aluminum, copper, nickel, and zinc. Those are each uh, in, in, instrumental to the infrastructure build out. And you can see across the board, each of these are at or historical low uh, levels of inventory, which really puts us out on a bad footing. It's a tough situation to be in when we look at the demand for some key industrial metals. Here, I've got copper specifically. You can see the projected demand based on clean energy source. Um, it's uh, electrical vehicles is the EV. Uh, you've got wind demand and you have solar and when you take a look at each one of these alone, they're expected to double uh, over for demand over the next few years. And that's largely because of electric vehicles as a percentage of total uh, motor vehicle sales are expected to, to exceed traditional um, uh, conventional vehicles uh, sometime in the next decade or so. And that's that chart on the left there. Um, on the right there, you can see that for certain regions like China and Europe, they've already exceeded that expected path. So. Um, in some areas, we're, we're right on, on kind of estimate. In the other areas, we are moving uh, a little bit faster than projected. Across here, digging a little bit deeper again, is copper usage. Um, you can see based on the type of car vehicles, you're, you're seeing incremental increases in the amount of copper that's required per car. Um, conventional cars, somewhere around 35 pounds of copper. As you step in, into hybrid electric vehicles, you, you about double the the requirement of copper from there to from hybrid to plug-in hybrids, you're adding on another 50 pounds or so, another 50 pounds to go up to battery electric vehicles, which is your Teslas. And then um, that's surprisingly fairly similar to the amount of copper that's required for uh, hybrid electric vehicles or hybrid electric buses, I should say. Um, and then of course, with a full battery electric bus, you're talking about 800 pounds or so. So demand of copper moves up quite high uh, and then from here, um, you can see the amount of CapEx, very similar to what we saw uh, for crude oil, same reasons. I won't belabor that point. Um, but one of these things that I've said, you know, in the past, you know, there's, there's really, you know, obviously there's no commodity printer, like there is a money printer over at the Fed. So there's no commodity printer out there that goes burr, you know, to, to generate you know, money overnight. You, instead, a lot of these projects, the, the petroleum, the crude oil projects, the industrial mining projects, those are all long cycle projects that can take anywhere from a decade uh, plus to, to go from that decision of whether or not to drill, um, to bring it to extraction and to basically refining the, the first usable products. You can see anywhere from 10 to 15 years in those long cycle projects before you actually are able to, to pump out usable gas or you know, extract and refine usable metals there. So. Um, while Europe was largely spared an energy crisis in 2022, largely because of Mother Nature, um, you know, th that's an example of how quickly sometimes these commodities are needed. But because of these underinvestment uh, in these production capabilities, you can't just turn the spigots on there. And then finally here, uh, before I pass on to Mayberry, is just the demand for nickel. 
uh, very similar in terms of the, the, the output demand for electric vehicles. You can see it rising and more than doubling over the next few years. So that's where we are in terms of the state of some of the, the fundamental and um, demand and supply drivers of why someone should consider investing in, in uh, a broad basket of commodities. So with that, uh, we're gonna talk about our approach here at, through the Double Line Strategic Commodity Fund, which is a product that we've been running uh, going back to 2015. Um, with that, uh, you can see on this first page here is the way that we think about our approach uh, to this space here. Um, you can see on, it's it's somewhat of uh, what one of our um, coworkers here at Double Line like to call the inverted pyramid. But what you have here is on the bottom, you have the Double Line Strategic Commodity Fund. And across the top, you have the two inputs that could go into the fund itself. So with it, the, the approach that we take is we want to have a long bias um, commodity fund that tactically allocates to a, um, a long short alpha strategy that we created here at Double Line. Uh, and the, the scenario under which we would allocate to that alpha is when a long commodity allocation is unattractive. So the way you can think about it is we can toggle between having 100% allocation to the beta um, and into this alpha during times where commodity performance might be perceived as weak in the current or future uh, type of outlook there. So with that, the, the beta component is comprised by an index that we outsource, and that's, re and that's called the, the Morgan Stanley. That's what stands, uh, the MS stands for. And then the BFMCI. The BFMCI, it's a very long acronym. acronym but it stands from for uh, backwardation focused multi commodity index, and again, that's what we use for our beta. And you can see on that uh, slide there that at minimum we're going to have an allocation of fifty percent to that beta weighting uh, at maximum one hundred. So the times that we bring it down to fifty percent and in between, we'd be allocated to the double line alpha strategy that we created here in house. It's a long short commodity strategy. Um, that uh, goes long and short, uh, a basket of each on, on five pairs of, or I'm sorry, on five uh, commodity positions. We'll dig into each one of these more in depth uh, over the next few slides, but effectively we took this approach to help investors take a strategic investment into the commodity sectors uh, based on the way to, to navigate the volatility of commodity markets. And we know from experience that you're not always going to want to be 100% long. And in those cases, you're going to want to toggle down into this uh, uncorrelated alpha source uh, that is the double line commodity long short part of the strategy. And vice versa, when commodities start to become a little bit stronger in terms of the, the broad basket of performance, um, then over that period of time, uh, we're going to go back into the uh, the beta. From there, there are no conversation around commodities would be complete uh, without a little bit of jargon. Um, and it's an unfortunate part, but we uh, will trudge through it together. Uh, and we're going to start out with this first piece of jargon that's called contango. Contango is when um, uh, the commodity futures curve, uh, depending on it's going to be commodity dependent, and when you take a look at it across the, the futures curve, then you're going to see an upward sli uh, slope to the prices, meaning that commodity futures that expire farther out in time, they're going to have a higher price uh, than something that is nearby or close to ex expiry. And from that, um, between the jargon, what the, the most important takeaway is when you see a commodity futures curve that is in this state of contango, again, upward sloping of price, then it likely will see a... Uh, experience what's referred to as a negative roll return. And that's as you get closer to expiry and you have to roll through your commodity futures return or any futures type of return, then you're going to have a negative type of roll experience as you, as you sell lower than the prices that you initially invested in. The good news is uh, commodities don't always live in the state of, commodity futures rather, don't always live in the state of entangle. Um, Oftentimes, we will see the state of backwardation, and that's where futures prices of these commodity contracts are at a lower level than they are closer they are to ex expiry. So under that condition, uh, what you get is as you move closer to expiry and you have to roll these uh, commodity futures, then you get what's called a positive state of roll return. 
Um, in this type of scenario here, we see a 5% positive roll return as when you bought the um, uh, a longer dated commodity future, let's say one month out at a price of 100, and that moves up to 105 as it gets closer to expiry, uh, then uh, you get that 5% um, positive roll return that's added on to your total return of investing within commodities. And when we think about scenarios that typically can drive this um, uh, state of backwardation, it's when people are more willing to pay a higher price to own a commodity or have access or exposure to a certain commodity today than at some point in the future. And some of the drivers there are listed at the second bo uh, bullet point. That could be adverse weather conditions, um, some supply chain disruptions or production failure, and or geopolitical risk. And this is where we saw the state of many commodities across the Bloomberg Commodity Index and those that we invest in. Um, they were in a state of backwardation in 2022. To further highlight this impact of positive row returns that you can have by having a long only exposure to a commodity, here we have listed three, oops, I just realized my camera's not on. Let me try to turn this on and see if it goes. Um, I can't see either way, but uh, hopefully it's on. Um, what we have here is three different indices that all reference um, WTI crude oil futures. When you take a look at the purple line, that is over the course of, um, looks like January 1st to February, perhaps 17, or February 21, uh, 2023. So it's, uh, it's very timely here. Uh, but if you had held over that period of time, you would have had an annualized return. And you can see this um, on the bottom left table there. This is gonna be the spot return if you just held on to the front month, uh, front month futures of WTI crude oil you have had a spot return of 1.6% annualized. If you had rolled these futures, bought one contract out and simply just rolled it each month during expiry, you will have had, because of the shape of the curve in backwardation, you would have had a positive roll return of 16%. Um, so uh, a pretty significant pickup from that roll return on an annualized basis by going into this excess return. That's, uh, again, I mentioned before that positive uh, roll return or negative ret roll return is an additional component to the overall total return of investing in commodities. One final component beyond just the price return as well is what's what's called, what we is encapsulated within the total return. And that's because by nature of investing in commodity futures based strategies, you can invest a portion of those proceeds um, into, uh, into a risk-free rate, into treasury um, T-bills or treasury bills, um, which today, as we know, pays somewhere around four to five percent. So with that, you can see in over that period from January 2022 over to February 21st of 2023, you know, T-bills on top of that, that's, that's the difference between the excess return and the total return, gave you somewhere close to three percent additional. And that kind of makes sense given where T-bill yields were over that uh, uh, period of time. So with that, that's the breakout of the components. You can see just by looking at front month futures, you would have thought you would have only had a 1.7% uh, type of, or 1.57% type of return in the spot. But in actuality, if you had invested in commodity futures, you would have had somewhere in the high teens type of return. Uh, diving into our MSBF MCI, which again, we use as our long only beta. This is going to be the long bias within the strategy and in, in which we will never be less than 50% of initial exposure on any given month, but up to 100%. You can see here that it's a fairly well diversified broad basket of commodities across metals. Um, you can see on the, and the table on the tables on the right side there represents about a third of the, the index, as does the energy component which is about 30, uh, also a third of the, the overall index. And then finally, what we refer to as agriculture and livestock. Um, and then with that, uh, you can see that's the final third. And within each of those complexes, they're fairly well diversified, giving us the exposure that we think uh, best represents those um, industrial, uh, those uh, various sectors within there. And we did have a hand in working with Morgan Stanley in determining these weights. Um, as well as the, the various allocations. But each one of these um, commodities themselves were uh, selected based on the idea of exhibiting historically a higher degree of uh, backwardation and thus trying to achieve that 
um, obtain that concept of generating that uh, positive row yield over time, which makes sense for having a long only type of exposure. You want to generate that uh, potentially incremental type of return from a uh, row return there in your long only positions. Moving over to what we use for the alpha component, and this is again the offsetting piece. Anytime we reduce the amount of exposure to the beta, we're going to put it here into the strategic commodity alpha that we created in house here. And from that, uh, this is based on the strategy that we've been running internally here at Double Line going back to 2012. It's a dollar neutral commodity strategy that's again selected of uh, five commodities that we choose to be long in this alpha basket. Uh, and that's offset by a basket of five commodities that we select to be short during that period of time. And those together make up the strategic commodity alpha. Now, you know, looking at the and using the jargon that we went through before, again, quite simply put, if something's in backwardation, it can has the potential to generate positive row return. That makes sense as candidates for the type of commodities that we would choose to be long in this alpha basket. Those that have uh, display contango in the futures curve, those have a tendency to generate negative row returns. So that would be a perfect comp, uh, candidate to, to be short against those basket of commodities. So that's kind of the way that we, we think about when we run this um, strategic commodity alpha. And when I say when we run it, I should take a step back here and say that the process itself is entirely systematic in determining which commodities will be long and which commodities will be short within this alpha um, basket here. But overall, what we're trying to do is we're trying to create a diversified and balanced portfolio that can invest across the, the greater commodity universe. You'll notice before, um, you may recall that when I was talking about the BFMCI, there is no exposure to precious metals. Um, the result of that is largely due to the fact that gold itself, um, just based on the, the, the structure of the commodity as a financial commodity, it tends to have a uh, uh, tends to trade in commodity, uh, sorry, in contango over time. So that's eliminated from the beta, but it could be picked up here in the strategic um, commodity alpha component uh, as we do include it within the universe there. To help give an example here, uh, we do have a slide here that shows example allocation. And I see that this is for as of uh, January 31st of 2023. Uh, we did have an exposure to this double line um, uh, long short commodity strategy, uh, the alpha component to the degree to the tune of 10%. We are 90% allocated to the beta uh, during this period of time and 10% uh, allocated to this alpha basket. So I mentioned before it's dollar neutral, an equal amount at the outset of dollars exposure to the long and short basket within the alpha. So if you can think about it here, the five positions that are above the horizontal line there, those are the commodities that we're long. Uh, each of those um, in, in combination within that, that would have represented 5% of the total exposure within the, um, the overall commodity strategy. And those were, you can see highlighted in blue there, uh, that was uh, components of the energy complex, Brent, gas oil, heating oil, and gasoline. Um, sugar was a, also a long position within there. That's highlighted by the green there. The rest on the bottom of the horizontal axis were the uh, components that we were short. Uh, that's natural gas, aluminum, gold, and silver, uh, as well as wheat there. So this is the how the positioning was for the double line commodity long short as of January 31st. I mentioned before that it's a systematic process that's rerun on a monthly basis in order to determine which components we want to be uh, long or short, if we are going to be in this alpha component. Hey, uh, Sam, I, I'm back. All right, that's a nothing, perfect nothing like your interwebs uh, to go down, uh, you know, halfway through a webcast. All I'll, right, I'll well, I was telling people that we're not on autopilot here, so, you know, <laughs> so I had to step in, but uh, I'm taking you back in and uh, it's all yours. All right, uh, here we go on this, uh, on this slide. Uh, as Sam said, this is the uh, this is the double line commodity long short allocation over time. You can see that it tends to move in phases. So, you know, early in when we first launched the fund in 2015, uh, we did see that the we were short energy. That's denoted by those red dots um, pretty much across the board energy, you know, Brent crude, gas, oil, heating oil, natural gas. We were short uh, then kind of, you know, go, go into that 2018 period. We were long that those energies. 
got short again right there at the, at the kind of bottom of the pandemic and then have been pretty much long energy since then. Um, if you look at something, the uh, precious metals and your and your industrial metals, typically those are uh, those are long only denoted by those green dots. But over re or over um, more recent time periods, uh, the gold and the silver have been uh, have been shorts. And as Sam showed you earlier, the uh, that that uh, gold uh, contract table or term structure of gold, uh, it's no surprise there that uh, once the Fed started raising interest rates and your, your cost of carry actually uh, your cost of carry due to those interest rates uh, was actually positive uh, or positive or negative cost of carry uh, that we became more short of uh, those precious metals. And then the agriculture commodities, uh, we can go long and short those and they just tend to move uh, in, in those phases. If we go to the next slide though, um, when we when we determine, so we have we have the two pieces, we have the more, the MSBFMCI and we have the uh, DCLS, the long short strategy. How do we determine when do we want to go 100% long and how to, when do we want to go 50% uh, long, 50% long short? Um, and this is what we do. We use the uh, we use our proprietary timing signal that was developed internally uh, by us, us here at DoubleLine. Um, and similar to uh, the, the DCLS, uh, it's a rules-based approach where we look at the relative attractiveness of investing in long only commodities. Um, as Sam likely mentioned, I didn't hear, but as he likely mentioned, uh, we do go down to about 50% long is when we're the most bearish and 100% when we're the most bullish. Uh, and, and the reason why we, we make that adjustment between those two, those two uh, endpoints is that, uh, you know, we want to make sure that it's a, it's a, it's a way to dampen the volatility, dampen the, the drawdown due to the commodities. We know commodities uh, has tended to be a very volatile market. Um, and if we can do anything we can to kind of dampen some of that volatility, make it more attractive to investors, uh, that's what this uh, tactical allocation uh, is doing and the timing signal is doing. Uh, we do, you know, the, the idea is to allocate to the long short strategy, which is uh, typically a low to, uh, to, a, to a low, lowly correlated or, or uncorrelated return source uh, that will just give us incremental returns. Uh, we do say that, you know, we can, we, we remain the, uh, we retain the discretion to adjust the strategy, uh, but we have yet to do so on in, in any any uh, meaningful manner. And you can see that over time here, this is the since the launch of, of our fund um, in May of 2015, so almost eight years ago now, uh, you can see we've been, uh, the, the blue line is our allocation to the long only commodities, um, and the gray is the allocation to the long short. Uh, they always add up to 100%. Uh, and you can see that there are times when we've been 50% uh, uh, the BFMCI, 50% long short, and then there's a very there's extended periods of time, nothing like uh, we saw in 2021, where we were 100% long the 100% of the time um, throughout the entire year. So no allocation to the long short strategy, and that was just due to you know when we do make this, uh, we do look at this, you can see that it's a rising market. You can see that black line is the BFMCI, and so we're trying to capture a lot of that upside that you do get in commodities. And then kind of uh, as we kind of shifted in that commodity land um, in, in kind of in the third quarter of um, of last year, shifting back down uh, to to lower allocations to the long short or to look to the long only, bottom down at 50 for for a quick second there, and then back up to uh, up to 80. And as Sam said earlier, and I did hear this, uh, we're at 90% allocation to the long only and 10% allocation to the long short uh, currently. If we do go look at the, um, if we go to this next page here. This is the calendar year returns. I'll cover this for for a little bit of time here. I look at the past the past three years. So 2020 uh, had some uh, underperformance to the to, underperformance to the uh, Bloomberg Commodity Index. Uh, we were running some analysis there and looking at the BFMCI. We did have some uh, outperformance of the BFMCI, mostly due to overweights to, to nickel and copper, um, and also soybeans, uh, but and no no natural gas. So that that was helpful as natural gas was down a lot there in in 2020 and. If you remember back in 2020, though, uh, gold and silver were uh, the precious metals were doing well. So having no exposure to those actually hurt your hurt their relative performance. Um, and really, uh, in, in that contract selection and choosing which futures contracts to be exposed to, or or which index which futures contracts the index is being exposed to, helped it helped mostly in the um, in the in the in the crude oil, so WTI and, and Brent crude. We kind of shift to 2021. As I mentioned, we were 100% uh, Bloomberg. Uh, BFMCI, 100% um, of the time, and so you can kind of see that that uh, that 31.24% in 2021 uh, was was relatively close to the uh, to the index returns. 
really uh, the, the big commodity, the big select sector selection, the commodity selection that led to a lot of the outperformance was due to no precious metals. Uh, and there was a modest negative uh, due to the overweight to soybeans and a little bit to coffee. Um, and and the, the futures contract selection doesn't, doesn't really uh, add or subtract anything. Then we get to 2020, 2022. Um, as, we, as we saw in that long short or in the long short allocation, uh, we were kind of uh, having that no exposure to those precious metals, which went down over time uh, and, and were, were the kind of the underperformers due to that, th that rise in interest rates uh, that helped the exposure. Um, it was kind of hurt by the overweight to copper, which earlier in the year was, uh, it, uh, earlier in last year, um, had some very good performance and then kind of fell off at the latter half of the year. Uh, so that overweight there uh, hurt. And then similarly to natural gas, um, everyone knows about natural gas, the story of natural gas there, where at one point it was up 167% a year to date in, you know, starting if you, if you had a dollar or a hundred dollars in natural gas uh, at, at January 30 or December 31st of 2021, you had $167 on August 22nd. Um, and then it fell 55% from there. And uh, so far year to date uh, through uh, Friday, natural gas is down another 45% almost a uh, year to date. So, you know, it, it had a, a rising boom and then has uh, has cratered since then. So not having that hurt in the beginning of 2022 and, and, and then helped a lot in the set latter half of 2022. Um, this is this data, um, it was the same, this, this 2023 year to date data is the same as uh, Sam Newsbaum uh, in the slide where January uh, and the BCOM was down 50, 50 basis points. If we go update this through uh, the end of, end of last week, so end of Friday, uh, we're down 1.8%, but the BCOM is down five. Uh, five was five percent. Uh, so you know it's, it was a kind of been a slow start to the year, uh, but good relative outperformance versus the BCOM. Not where we really want to be in an absolute performance uh, basis, but the the strategy is doing what it wants. Uh, so we we're doing what we want it to do. Uh, the overweights to copper has helped uh, again, as I said, and no no exposure to natural gas, um, and and then really it's doing you know that that we, because we're ninety percent uh, long, ten percent long short. We have a you know we have that slight decrease to exposure to the beta. Uh, in the down market, so that's been helpful. And then the uh, long short commodity strategy has been accretive to performance, uh, which is uh, which is kind of the the way we want it to work. Um, it doesn't always work, but that's just the way we want it to work. And so uh, this is a good example of of the commodity strategy being strategic and uh, helping us along along the way here so far in 2023. And knock on wood, hopefully that holds up for the rest of the year. Uh, here we go. Uh, this is for completeness. This is the uh, growth of a dollar through time. You can see that. Uh, when we launched the fund, it started in a, in a very um, poor time to be invested in commodities. You can see that huge rebound since the bottom there in uh, 2020 in, in COVID times. Uh, we do we are providing a higher higher sharp ratio, uh, lower volatility than the Bloomberg Commodity Index, or, or I, I guess I call that same vol volatility, 14.96 versus 15.19 uh, in a commodity land. That's that's a very similar volatility, but you are getting some outperformance there, higher sharp ratio. Um, and for that, you know, also when you look at this, you can see the uh, the dark blue line um, is the double line, the, the long short strategy. Uh, there are times and, you know, certainly in 20, 2021, uh, we were not invested in this, but because it is a systematic strategy, we can we can uh, calculate what, what the returns would have been. Um, so for completeness, we will show it even though uh, it doesn't uh, it doesn't affect the, the returns of the, of the strategy overall, but we wanna know what the uh, long short strategy would have done. Um, and you can see that, uh, you know, over time, we have a lot of outperformance in kind of a down market, which makes sense because we're dialing back that exposure. Uh, the most we can be is 100% in the long only, in the long beta. We can't be more than 100%. Uh, so we're kind of capped out as, as how, how, how high we could be um, in, in a rising market, which we have, which we saw kind of from, you know, uh, April, May of 2020 through April, May of 2022, uh, right when Sam and I did this, uh, this webcast last time. Um, and I guess with that, uh, you know, I'll, I will go through go through some of the questions that we had here. I know we did we did see some questions, um, a pretty good amount of questions here. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll cover them, even though I don't know if Sam had covered them or not. Um, so I'll cover uh, most of the questions here. First one is uh, Paul Mahalo, Paul. Um, he wants to know how how we how we short things and what would trigger a short in commodities. Um, hopefully, when we went over the long short strategy, uh, we did talk about. Or you know, it, it was clear that we were short things uh, that are kind of more more contangoed. Something like gold, which we're short, 
Uh, we saw that that uh, gold curve there. Uh, natural gas, which while well, highly seasonal, uh, if you kind of look at the, the floors in those prices, uh, still a contango uh, contango shaped curve. So those are the type of opportunities we're looking for. We're not looking for um, we're not looking for things that we look at uh, as a uh, from a fundamental basis as a short. We're really looking at things that we when we look at it and we say technical over the next month. What do we think is is the best opportunity to be um, longer short or shorter commodity? Uh, then we have a question here about uh, commodity demand from the pending uh, pending rebuilding of Ukraine. We haven't really thought about, or I haven't really thought about that yet. Um, I think that uh, you know I, here we are a, a year in from uh, from the invasion of Ukraine, and it doesn't seem like there's any end in sight. I think that as we do get to a place where uh, re Ukraine is 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 being rebuilt. Uh, that it certainly seems like uh, the you know the so-called West will help in that rebuilding, and you're going to see a lot of demand for uh, kind of your industrial metals because they're going to need those are going to be needed uh, to help with that potential rebuild, and certainly a lot of your uh, your energy and your or your or petroleum commodities are going to be needed there to get uh, up and running very quickly. Um, the uh, we have another question here: How do uh, how do we look at the tactical overlay that it reduces directionality? We use we call that the timing signal. Uh, we call that as the um, how do we make that 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 uh, uh, how do we when do we want to reduce that that uh, allocation to the long only beta? Um, and it is it, the question is is it mainly momentum based? Um, and then, you know it, we also look we look at momentum, we look at the breadth of the market, we look at the individual commodities, we look at the term structure. We kind of look at everything we can think of um, and put it into the model to try to give us a, the best outlook. Of what we think uh, the direction of the quantities is going to be over the over the next month or so, um, you know. Uh, the next question is about the uh, about the oil market. Uh, they want to know about um, tightness in supply, not much capex going into new projects, SPR depleted, and China reopening. I think that uh, Sam covered a lot of this uh, at, the, at the beginning of the webcast. Certainly, uh, SPR and uh, not a lot of capex. I think that if you do get the China reopening, and if you and you did see that uh, crude oil curve. <laughs> earlier in, in the webcast, you, it does look like it's peaking there in, in the summer. How much of that is um, the fact that uh, at least earlier or you know, maybe a month ago, uh, the markets were pricing in maybe a little bit of a slowdown here in the U.S. economy. Um, that, that seems to have been pushed out uh, due to the strength of the labor market. Uh, but also that China reopening happening, people are expecting that to happen in the, in the kind of the first quarter of the year because that has been slow to uh, – you know, that's slow to come to fruition. I think that uh, people are starting to push that China reopening back to the second half of 2023. And so uh, you're starting to see a little bit of that in the um, in the oil market. And, you know, if we do get a full blown, full blown China reopening, I would expect that the, the oil market due to that tightness in supply um, and, and certainly the SPR isn't going to be able to uh, be depleted anymore or not much more anyway, uh, that that would lead to uh, rising oil prices. Um, we have a question on what other commodities are on the fund. Hopefully, uh, Sam covered that. Uh, we do have 11 commodities in the fund, ones that are mostly backward dated, uh, have been historically backward dated. And yes, we do avoid some commodities uh, such as gold and natural gas. Uh, there's a reason natural gas is uh, in the commodity world is referred to as the widow maker, um, up 167% in a few months, and then uh, giving it all back and then some uh, in, the, in, the, in a more few, in a, you know, in another eight months or so, uh, certainly not. Uh, Certainly, that type of volatility is is not uh, conducive for a st strategic commodity fund. Um, yes, yeah, so we have another another question on natural gas. We just covered that. Uh, do we project copper and nickel prices to skyrocket over time? I think skyrocket is a pretty aggressive word. I would say that uh, given the fundamental uh, fundamental um, characteristics that Sam outlined earlier in the webcast, we do uh, we would, pro would project that. Uh, you know, demand to uh, I would say demand could skyrocket on, on those on those two industrial metals over time. But uh, unless we get some some uh, new mines coming to uh, coming to market or or some uh, you know a new source of of those or alternatives, that I think that the prices could could move uh, similarly. Um, you know, uh, one of the, we have a question: Why are we only rebalancing annually? That's for the index. The uh, BFMCI only rebalances annually in January. Uh, that's the commodity way. So both the GSCI and the Bloomberg Commodity Index only rebalance annually. Uh, they are the the GSCI and the Bloomberg Commodity Index are um, their, their weights are calculated based on production. 
Uh, Bloomberg has some caps, so there's not overweight energy such as the GSEI is. Um, and so that takes the time for them to, they can't, they can't, um, you know, to, to be able to calculate those numbers uh, more frequently than annually uh, doesn't really, it's not really feasible. So that's why they do it annually. And we wanted to be very similar in, in terms of uh, letting your, letting your winners run. Um, and, uh, you know, that's why we, we kind of uh, worked with, uh, worked with the index provider to kind of come up with that annual uh, rebalancing. Uh, we have a question on is, is, uh, the strategic commodity fund better to invest while short-term treasuries are yielding close to five? Yes, uh, we do get our commodity exposure uh, via swaps. And so that leaves us with uh, the capital to invest and uh, we're, we're not uh, going crazy and going to uh, buying uh, uh, anything other than short-term treasuries. Uh, so you're, you, when, you, when you are you know, investing short-term treasuries, you're rolling three-month T-bills, six-month T-bills, uh, you know, nine-month T-bills, uh, you're, you're making that return. Um, and so I would say that, you know, marginally it's better. Um, it, certainly the commodity volatility is going to, you know, it, over, over the short term is going to overwhelm that, uh, and even the long term is going to overwhelm that, that, that yield. Uh, but yeah, uh, you know, it's better than buying T-bills at, at zero, certainly. Um, and then the, the last question here is, can we talk about the agriculture outlook? Now, you know, the agriculture is, is something that is a, you know, as you notice, Sam didn't cover, didn't talk too much about ags in the uh, in the fundamental story. <clears throat> and really, when you look at it, so much of, so much of it is driven by weather. So much of it is driven by um, so much is driven by weather. So much is driven by you know. There was a lot of talk about uh, wheat prices were going to go through the roof uh, because of uh, Ukraine not being able to plant all the, or the all their wheat crops, and that you know kind of worked itself out and uh, hasn't uh, come to become a problem too much. Uh, thus far. So, you know, I think the agriculture is something that we look at um, and we don't really look at it as from a fundamental perspective. We look at it as being a, por a good portion for diversification. <coughs> it it give, offers diversification within your commodity. So you, you're diversifying your diversification, uh, gives you that lower correlation. So we like to have it as a good piece. You know, it is, a, it is almost a third of the, um, of the, the BFMCI index. So we like to have that piece there. Uh, but it's really not a, a case where we're looking at it and trying to make a projection on uh, what we think is going to happen from a fundamental perspective. Uh, that's just, you know, I guess given weather, given global warming, um, you know, some some commodities are going to do better in warmer weathers and some are not. Uh, so from that perspective, we're really not to, not really trying to, to get out there in terms of uh, trying to, to trying to decide what um, or, or where to where to invest in there from from a agriculture side. So hopefully that answers everyone's questions. Um, thanks for tuning in. Sorry for the uh, technical difficulties. Uh, hopefully Sam uh, Sam uh, stepped in and uh, I'm sure that he did well. So thank you for listening and uh, good luck.